I mean, okay, I'll hear it. Yeah. This is the time and place to quote people sometimes to have our uh, first workshop our, for the 2017 IRP process. Did I say 17? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I do think it may be wise because we have a few people that uh, people might not know who it is. Tomorrow we may have more that are uh, involved than uh, some of you know. But today, uh, at least for Vaughn's benefit, I want to be able to have uh, him at least know some of the names that I've said. And he'll go, oh, that's who that is. No. Uh, anyway, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Barry McKay with Questar, and I'm working the regulatory area. Vaughn Shostak, working operations. Then we'll wrap the division. Jennifer Clark with Custer I do legal work. Evan Engelson with the office. Bailey Vostok, also with the office. Peter Ashcroft with the Office of Energy Development. Another office. <laughs> Another one. Ben <laughs> Horner with the BSC. It's calling you out. <laughs> Jordan White, PSC. Dave Clark, PSC. John Harvey, Commission Staff. Eric Martinson, Commission Staff. Sherry Vance, Commission, Commission Staff. <clears throat> Will Schwarzenbach, uh, Gas Supply, Quest of Gas. Tina Faust, Office of Gas Supply. Abby Thomas, Quest Star Engineering. Excellent. Car Carolyn Roll Division. Carol PSC. <clears throat> Thank you, and we've got uh, Abby and Vaughn are actually going to be participating and sharing a few things that we're reporting on uh, today, and I think we may have a few more from our regulatory group, and I don't know if, uh, oh, do we have anybody on the phone or do we know? Danny Martinez is supposed to be calling in, but okay. I don't think he has yet. So, um, you know, we, we talked yesterday that... Uh, we thought this was going to be a completely public meeting, but as we ended up reviewing some slides, we found out that a few at the end, so we've rearranged some things so that uh, the confidential portion will, at the end here will just be able to go into that. Um, and, but that said, I think most of this, you're going to be able to ask questions as we go. Uh, and we wanted to, first of all, mention the commission sent out notice on this. We're having our February 1 meeting, obviously, right now. We've got next one scheduled at the end. Forgot to mention, would you like to introduce yourself, Colleen? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there we have our April one. Uh, we're going to be talking, uh, you'll see what today's agenda is. We're going to be focusing on our gas supply, our storage, our transportation uh, in this meeting. Most of this meeting will probably be of a confidential nature. Some of it might not be, but th that one. This one will have just a small portion of it that uh, will end up being confidential. That's some of the responses we have to our IRP. Uh, we're, uh, Wexpro is going to be planning, uh, giving us a summary of their drilling plan, a few things in that. I think the commission actually, when they gave notice of it, did a really good job with uh, kind of some bullet points of what we were talking about. This was kind of uh, driven. Gas supply. Uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I recognized my voice. <laughs> and then that's our regular technical conference. You'll notice there's a gap here in March. We're not afraid of March. Uh, we know that this is lots of times driven by questions or things. If there is something, we need to put another meeting out there. We could. We note that last year uh, there were some questions related to IRP. We ended up having <coughs> another meeting on that in August, I think it was. So it's flexible. This is a process that almost happens around the full calendar year. But... Uh, that said, today we're going to be talking a little bit. Uh, we want to just give you an update. Uh, we laugh, but the best news, I think, of the merger integration is I'm still employed. I feel really good about it. I don't know about the rest of the people, but uh, no. Actually, it's moving along very well. Uh, we have uh, had a voluntary uh, option for severance that actually had people choosing to say they'd like to go move forward with retirement and uh, actually had a higher number than anticipated. That is actually in all the numbers that it was offered to and who, who took that will be in the first merger integration report. Uh, the reason I know all of that is that Wyoming, for some reason, the only place that we weren't totally synced up with Utah and Wyoming was they wanted that first report in January. Uh, Utah wanted it after the first quarter. Uh, it actually makes a little bit more sense because it would be better organized by the time we file it here in uh, Utah. But Colleen? Should we clarify that that was for shared services employees, not for... Good point. Yeah. 
really good point. <laughs> uh, and then the rest, we hope uh, you're not seeing too much difference in the service or our response. Uh, we've been able to be meeting with the parties on some of the other commitments, and we'll continue to do so. Um, anyway, we acknowledge that that's there, and we're integrating and moving forward with that. Uh, we're going to review the commission order here from that was just uh, issued here at the end of the last quarter. IRP standards and guidelines. I have a habit of forgetting those. Uh, Carol does a really good job of helping me remember, and uh, we're going to actually do better because I was found out it was part of last year's presentation too. And then we got our appliance survey that Abby's going to be discussing here and the results that we did in 2016. Some of you may remember that we did a similar study um, back in about 2006, 2007. Wanted to give you an update on that. And then uh, we've got Vaughn and Will here that will talk about our January 6th weather event. This is totally interactive, so if there's a pause button and you want to ask questions or something's not making sense, um, stop us. Um, there's really just two specific things that I lifted, and I can be found to be incorrect, but uh, coming out of the Commission's order, encourage us to continue to monitor the heat pump trends, particularly as it related to the peak day and cost recovery. Uh, some of you may remember that we actually reported on heat pumps this last year as an item that we had tagged. We were asked to do a presentation on that. We did in our May meeting. We're encouraged to continue to monitor that. We aren't seeing a lot in it. It will be that will be written up in the report. If things change, I think that's what the direction was. We should report on it. The other thing we were uh, directed to do was to have the DSM advisory group collaborate with Questar to explore ideas related to uh, helping to reduce our load on the peak day slash peak hour. We not only will be doing that in our advisory group meetings, but you'll see in our presentation on the 28th, we were very focused on this and actually wanted that to be part of our IRP workshops too. So those are the two things coming out of the order. This is a kind of a lift from the Commission's uh, rules and guidelines that we've kind of spelled out here. And uh, which year was it? Was it 07, 08, Carol, that... Um, Maybe 12 or something. Yeah, like could have been. I, one of those years. <laughs> but um, this is evolving, too. Uh, that's something I'd like to point out in that we recognize that these things can be modified. We could be asked to do things. But we are required each year right now with the rules to identify these things. So in our April meeting this year, We'll be talking about the latest quarterly bearings report. That's something we're supposed to do by rule and order. We're supposed to identify if we have any significant changes in our modeling. Sometimes we've come in in these workshop meetings and we've done a whole presentation on this is what's changing or this is the results or this is how we do it. We haven't identified any of those this year because we really don't have any identified changes. So we're not changing that. We're not uh, doing any changes in our send out model. We'll be talking about the results of it though still in our presentation in April as well as in our report. No significant changes in our energy efficiency or DSM. Um, this will be, the send out model will be part of the IRP report. This gas quality and gas storage is kind of all in one paragraph, but we are going to be splitting them out as far as uh, what we're reporting on. Gas quality is related to how's our interchangeability of our gas, how have our appliance has been performing. Uh, we're going to be talking about that here in just a minute. And then on February 28th, the specific things related to storage, transportation, gas supplies we'll be talking about. Not any significant changes in our modeling here with our gas network analysis. We'll be reporting on that, though. That's a requirement that we provide that in our IRP. That will be in it. Uh, the integrity management issues. We got mega rule, and if anybody can uh, bet or tell us for sure when that's going to come out, uh, we'd like that. But uh, Vaughn's there, too. We kind of talked about it. We're not waiting. There's some, the dice cast, you can see where the, where we're headed. And so we're beginning and have, even before that's come out, to begin to implement some of the practices. Um, and so that's been part of our good practices already. We'll speak to those and kind of have that be discussed uh, in our infrastructure update meeting that's also at the end of April. Uh, but we'll be speaking to that, and obviously if things change and we need a whole meeting that related to it, we'll have an update meeting there. And then uh, any other issues that we may have. 
we'll talk about. <coughs> and heavy. Far away. Everybody's awake right now. I want you to know oh, that. I didn't put them to sleep. Okay, so if anybody remembers 2006 2007, Quest started an appliance survey after we had changed the will we set points as a follow up to see how our green sticker program had done and where we sat. And the recommendations from our consultant, Chuck Benson, were continue operating as you were with the Wobe Ranges, continue the green sticker program, and conduct a follow-up survey. So we worked on the follow-up survey. <laughs> we once again retained Chuck Benson and his company to assist us in this. And most of the charts and things you see today they prepared. We're just reporting on them. So we did one zone that was apples to apples comparison of what we did in 2006. We also wanted to validate or refine the gas quality management strategies. So this year, we divided the service area into different zones. Like I said, Utah is exactly the same as we did before. We did Eagle Mountain because that's a new territory for us, and we wanted to see how those appliances were as well as we did Idaho because we did not study that last time. We also did Wyoming as part of the study, but we're not going to report that to you right now. If you guys want to go to Wyoming on Friday, there's still that's an open invitation. <laughs> <laughs> they are hearing this on Friday, but yeah. So we figured out the sample sizes for each zone. We chose the customers randomly, and we held a technician. Chuck Benson came out and trained the technicians on exactly how we wanted them to take all the measurements so that it was consistent. We collected a lot of data. If we went into one home, we checked every gas appliance they had for all of these different things. So they did a handful that were just data you could see and then a bunch of things that you had to measure. Flow rate, pressure, CO. This, like that. Now this isn't done overnight. Our challenge with this one is that because we wanted to be able to draw conclusions from it, it had to be random. And therefore we had to draw the sample. And so when people blew us off or said jam it, we had to keep following them back up with them. And when we finally realized that they would not respond and we couldn't get into their home, we had to go to the next one that had already been randomly chosen. We couldn't just go next door neighbor. And so it was a little more challenge. Vaughn's people had to go and do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Idaho and Evanston were probably the hardest. So... What we looked at was the population appliances in each zone. How many furnaces were there? How many water heaters? The distribution there. We looked at how many had low CO emissions and the distribution of the AGA flame codes. We talk about this a lot if you guys are familiar. You want the nice blue flame, you don't want the yellow tips, and you don't want the really pointy blue flames. <laughs> so plus or minus two is where we want it. How did you define low CO emissions? We'll talk about that. So there is an ANSI standard for percent of CO emitted, and we use those for each type of appliance. And then there's this NYSEARCH interchangeability project team. We fund some NYSEARCH studies with R&D dollars, but the team is kind of the industry standard for key appliance population <coughs> performance parameters, meaning they will set, say, <laughs> this many, if you have 5% of appliances that have bad CO readings, you're doing okay. Or if you have under 5, you're okay. They kind of set the benchmark for what's acceptable. So we compared our results to their. It's similar to like, you can never have, I liken it, you never can get total full employment out there. I mean, if you get down to 1 or 2% that's unemployed, you're always going to have that many people moving between jobs. You're always going to have a certain number of appliances for whatever reasons when you go and do that in a given calendar year that are going to, just because of their age or whatever, not be in compliance. So that's similar to the standard that they made. So, and like I said, our consultant prepared most of these today. So we'll dive right in. The, this is the Utah zone. Just pretty evident here. We have a lot of furnace and water heaters and not too, and a random assortment of other appliances. So I, I'm going to make the sample. I think in Utah it was about 600. And that? total, uh, we, we, we had a total of over a thousand. Yeah, I think it was a thousand or twelve hundred almost. Yeah, uh, and when, you, when we say Utah, I just want to help refresh everybody's memory. That's everybody in Utah except for 
Eagle Mountain. And the Eagle Mountain had not been in the previous one, so we carved out. We're not going to carve out Eagle Mountain again in the future. They've been blended in with that. But to make it an apples to apples, we had to do that. But we did this so it, we could statistically uh, draw the conclusions. And actually, if people want that detail. We, we do have all of that. We haven't necessarily prepared our slides in that manner. But that was uh, some exciting moments as we decided yeah. sample size. Just two, uh, two questions. Is, is the boiler different than, what's the difference between it? I think it's the end use. You know, the boiler does heat water, but it's not used for showers, I think, is the main Oh, it's difference. not used, it's, it wouldn't be like a, a furnace that's not... It's not like a forced air furnace. Right. right. Is that the boiler, is that? Or the, the boiler, furnace? yeah. Okay. yeah Radiant heat. The boiler basically puts, you, you put uh, heated water through your house, and that's how you get your okay. heat. Okay. And the next one, the oven, is that, is that a cooktop or is that the cooktop? Yeah, oven and range. Oh, yeah, he just called them oven. He just okay. correlated. He cooked them together because usually they're the same. So one household could have several of those. Yes. Right? And they all had at least one, so you wouldn't be talking about Exactly. Yep. The techs liked the houses that had six appliances because then they could get six appliances in one stop. <laughs> I'm shocked how few ovens. I was too. That's amazing. Hmm. Pardon? <laughs> you know, oh, well, before, be, before the merger, I don't really get offended by that statement, but it, it's okay now. <laughs> when, they, when they come out with a gas microwave, I may compare. <laughs> I could never cook with electric. <laughs> Uh, actually, the real cooks want a gas stove. Right. Right. See, I have both. Is what, what's I have, the of your Because I have two ovens and I, yeah. That so that's what I've heard is the. We, uh, uh, as far as the new population, okay, we get new homes built, we're 98 plus. Okay, in the uh, other areas, we're between 90 and 95 that have both space and water heat, which is amazing. As we compare ourselves with other AGA companies around the nation, they, there's a significant amount that, if they're in competition with the electric company, are fighting the electric water heat versus gas water heat. That we have that much that a dual is, is really a high thing. And I think it's, uh, a lot of our area has grown. In other words, we've got a big population and we've done a really good job of getting those two stubbed out, I think, in the homes. It's far more efficient. We have uh, far less emissions. I mean, you're going to hear me give a commercial for gas here, so I'll stop. But uh, I was surprised that we didn't have more dryers. I mean, I started my career working for the electric company, but I had a gas dryer from the day I started. And newly married says I want a gas dryer because I knew of the cost. But obviously, that is not what we're seeing in the industry. The other one, cooking, is I think moving up because people love the stovetop gas. They, we do not get very many ovens <laughs> or microwaves. There's very few microwaves that are gas. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm curious. So you said you had a thousand in your sample. You only got 260. Oh well, wait, 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 wait. You haven't seen everything. for all of our regions. We had a thousand. Yeah, for the in whole. In Utah, we had about 600. Yeah. So why? Why are there 600? Because we didn't go into 600 well, homes, we did 600 appliances in roughly 290 yeah. homes or so okay. in Utah. Yeah. yeah. No, appliances. Okay. Better communication has just occurred. <laughs> okay, so in Utah, if you say were, com were appliances compliant or not, 3.9% had non compliant CO emissions. That's the red over there. Based on what the NYSEARCH team said, if you're below 6%, you're doing well. So we're doing great in Utah. So the mar marginals here is still okay. Yes. But we categorize it as just, it's on the border. But it, it passes, it'd be mm -hmm. fine. We don't reg tag it. Um, and non compliant, we don't reg tag. Most non compliant things we can fix. Can we? Yes. You adjust them and they're in compliance and you move on. So is that an issue of the gas pull or just the appliance? No, it's just the appliance. Yeah. Because we're doing very well on our mm -hmm. gas interchangeability, okay. but set points are only as good as people setting to those set points. Oh. And that's what we're checking is, are they setting to the set point? 
We don't have any intent of changing those anytime soon. <laughs> Thankfully. Absolutely. Then if you look at the flame code, plus or minus two is where, what you're after. So yellow tipping was in 2.3% of the units, and that's well under the 5% limit they've established. And in all the flame code ones, we threw out fireplaces because you want those to be yellow. So they skew all your results. And then Eagle Mountain. Why do you want them to be yellow? So they look pretty. pretty. It's just yeah, it has nothing to do with yeah. heating. It's actually more good for the utility. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, romantic. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So here's your evidence. Eagle Mountain, mostly very new homes. Like Barry said, nearly as many water heaters as furnaces. I mean, most homes have both. You wonder why you have more water heaters than you have furnaces is people do a lot of tandem stuff now where they have two water heaters in the home and one of them they have at a very low temperature and then it just runs into one that they keep it a higher. They've actually proved that's more efficient uh, for storage water. <coughs> Look at that. We're Look very glad that. we have Eagle Mountain. That was it. I mean, we knew why we bought one of Eagle Mountain. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Less than 1% or not. Again here, really good on the flame code. So next we get to Idaho. Years ago, I think Idaho was on liquid propane. We have 2,000 customers here in preface for what you're going to now see. <laughs> the next slide you mean? Distribution. The not yeah. so good slide. <laughs> yeah, better ovens. <laughs> so we had about 12% with non-compliant CO emissions in Idaho. Not a good number. Flame code was looking better. We were below the 5% limit here. So getting into some comparisons, this is just Utah, 2006 to today. You compare all the appliances, 2006, 5.3 were non-compliant CO emission, and today it's only 3.9. So we're doing better. Feel you get appliances with green stickers on them. 1.6 were non-compliant, and now it's only one, less than 1%. So the green sticker program is good. Without a green sticker, we used to have 5.5, and, and we're up to 7.2% of, of the appliances without a sticker are out. Hmm. Part of that is the population shrunk. We'll get into this. That doesn't mean they're non-compliant, without a green sticker. Right. It doesn't right. mean they're not they compliant, just means, right. right. But we just, we categorize them yeah. with and without, and so those without had a higher. Chris was trying to see, yeah, should we continue the green sticker part of this program, and does it work? And it seems so, to be. I guess on that last slide, I'm intrigued. What, if you've got something that's non-compliant with the green sticker, what? That means it's gone out of adjustment since the green sticker was put on, or the tech did the work inappropriately and still oh, put a sticker oh, on. So it's things like that. The CO, not that. Okay. Yeah, just Thank the CO. Okay. So here now we'll just look at what has a sticker on it. 2006, 24% of the appliances in the program, which is just space and water heating. We don't green sticker your range in your kitchen. Um, had green stickers in Utah today, 43% have them. So we've done a good job of still putting stickers on appliances. Eagle Mountain, where we have never told people to put stickers on, 30% still have them. <laughs> we take that to mean a lot of the same technicians are installing furnaces in Eagle Mountain as in Questar Gas previous areas. And in Idaho, where we have not really pushed the green sticker either, 10% had stickers on. So what to do about Idaho? <laughs> we looked into the notes the technicians made when they found things out of compliance, and overfiring was a big cause. And it's caused by the wrong orifice size or high manifold pressure. Both of these things can be adjusted by someone who's qualified and brought into range. So when our techs did the testing before they left, they would adjust the appliance. Is that so oversized or undersized? Overfiring. Okay. Okay. It's too, too, yeah. big. too big. Yeah. Yeah. Too big. Yeah. Which could be the propane orifice was it bigger or smaller? They're smaller, much smaller. Okay, so that wouldn't have, no. wouldn't have anything to do with it, would it? There's one woman. Someone fixed their stove because she wouldn't use it because when it was before, it would turn her pots black. 
He goes, oh, it's been set for gas this whole time, and he lit it, and it worked great. <laughs> he goes, you fixed my stove. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some conclusions. These came directly from Chuck Benson. Utah is improving. The green sticker program is effective. We know about Idaho. <laughs> and here's what he's recommended to us. Continue to manage gas supplies within the ranges. That's our plan. He always tells us, notify commercial and industrial customers if you're going to have a significant change. We kind of did this with the biogas study we did before where we didn't notify them because there won't be a big change, but we did get information from them to make sure we didn't cause a change that would impact them. I think we're doing well there. Continue emphasizing annual inspections. This is our plan. We've been pushing this with fall prep and all the advertising. Then in Idaho, use some proactive measures. One is share to find best practices with the service contractors. We're planning some meetings where we can invite them in, go over our list of what a good inspection is, remind them about duration. We have a new iPhone app that has the best practices in it so you can look up right where you are and know exactly how to set something. So make sure they know how to use that. Yeah, some of you may remember we actually when we put together and going way back to quote the green sticker accord. Uh, but we, we brought in HVAC people from Park City to Utah County, all the way up and down the Wasatch Front, which is where we had a lot of focus. We didn't have anybody from Idaho, and looking back, that really helped to jumpstart, I think, our HVAC people knowing what that is. We're going to try to do the same thing with just Idaho. We thought that it would just be a spillover from, from Logan, but we're not seeing a problem necessarily in the Logan area, but we're going to try to specifically focus on that. Mm -hmm. Then his other suggestion was to consider incentives for homeowners getting these appliance checkups. So we're looking into some of that as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think, yeah, John yeah. did. So, so two questions. Uh, for the Idaho, do the, I'm assuming there's other natural gas utilities in Idaho, do they have different set points than you do? I wonder if it's a case where their technicians are setting them for the wrong... Yes, there's other gas companies in Idaho. Uh, this area was not served by natural gas until we came. And it's small, it's far more oriented to the Cache Valley area than any other area in Idaho. Our assumption was that that's where their services would be coming from. We don't know if it's just one guy in town that went and did all of them or didn't have, necessarily have good training. We're getting the data. We're going to try to go out and discover that. But we don't necessarily think that it's some guy that's moved down here from Pocatello, which has gas from Intermountain Gas. Yeah, another He's thing it might be is a lot of do-it-yourself. And that's yeah, the other one. You that's drive it. to Home Depot, you buy a furnace, and you hook it up. Yeah, they you go from there. They've, so. done, they've done everything in that area <laughs> for. Uh, but uh, maybe the phone app would help. If, they, if, if we get if we get a properly trained person, we'll get good appliances. That's what we're seeing. It surprised us. I'll tell you this. I, I, I was surprised with this result because the other parts of our service territory, which has had gas, obviously, Eagle Mountain's a good example. Eagle Mountain didn't even exist until, what, 2000? 97. Okay, 1997 it started. Right. And, and it's going gangly. It's wonderful. But uh, we did southbound in 87 when we went down uh, to southern Utah. We've had very good results of, of uh, appliances being properly set in those towns. So we just need to focus on it, and we'll do it. Mm -hmm. The other question was then what, I, I, I think I'm confused between two different slides, but what percentages of furnaces say on the Wasatch Front would have a green sticker and be compliant? Oh, and be compliant? So put it this way, if it has a sticker, it is very unlikely it's not in compliance. We didn't have that number exactly in here. But and the number that we could get that. Sticker, that's only like 25%. No. So it's up to 40%. 40 now. There we go. 43% now. Oh, the 2006 was okay. Yeah, so we're doing a whole lot better than we were in 2006. But we still have more than half the moment. Because mm -hmm. a lot of they aren't re contractors are not required to put a sticker on. It was in the we, building code for a few years? Yeah, yeah. it was in the building code. They changed the code. We would have loved to have seen yeah. that mandate. The mandate was they were supposed to 
put on a sticker. Green oh, in our survey asked, is there a sticker? It didn't have to be. It didn't have to be green. It could be clear. It could but be brown. Just that if you have a sticker and say you rent a place or move into a new home and you see a sticker, you can have a good confidence that things have been done correctly. The, the real estate industry embraced it. And actually, it's helped with the turnover in homes that that's one of the things that they've gone and checked for. The home building didn't. And so... We lost that because we lobbied to get it in, and we did. And then I think a year or was it two years later that it mm -hmm. moved out of the requirement. Um, we do think that there was some confusion in the past, the way it got rolled out, as this is bad gas or the gas is changing. And so Abby's statement is, is we, there's no change in our gas supply, and we're going to continue to manage within the range. And that's what we always have done with hindsight we think we could have maybe done better in our communication there. But uh, I think as you see us come out, and you may be see a little bit stronger campaign, we'll be emphasizing the right things, the clear things, and I think that the industry is backing us up. They use this as a way to get into homes, a way to do the fall prep. We asked Chuck business. Benson, who has a program we could look at, and he said, I tell everyone to look at your program. <laughs> so, doing what we can. And, or all your um, I think Vaughn are you conclusions yeah, uh, we did all those. Mm -hmm. yep. you demand <laughs> tell us how cold it got let me just tell you this um, <clears throat> I missed it it was 1996 when you come out so uh, I don't know many many of you may have heard about our little event uh, January 6th up in Colville uh, pretty serious deal. It was very cold, and uh, it was uh, one of those situations where there were probably uh, risks to life when it was all said and done, and we were really concerned about it. So uh, we tried to jump on it as quickly as possible and make things happen in order to get those people back in gas. But we'll kind of go through things. Uh, about 6:30 or 6:40 a.m., we started receiving calls. Now we receive calls every once in a while. We don't have any gas. Uh, but usually we have to wait till we get two or three before we know it's a, a major outage. And uh, so it took us a little bit of time to get things organized. But uh, about 7.30, I, I called what Colleen No and, and Craig Wagstaff that we had, we thought was a major outage. We still were not absolutely positive. We were getting enough calls that we thought uh, it's probably happening. So. At 8 o'clock, I walked into the EOC. Now, the EOC is the emergency operating center that we have there at Quest Arch, right next to dispatch. And we've set that up a few years ago. Uh, it's, it's really a nice area, but we have uh, television monitors in there. We can monitor news. We've got phones in there. We've got dispatch in there. Uh, we've got a situation where we can, we can uh, call out to people and send out orders. And uh, it just works out to be a real good uh, emergency operations center. We had all of the company from that one area, and I'm the, uh, I'm the guy that kind of runs that. So at 8.15, uh, we realized that we needed some help. We weren't going to be able to get this done with just those people that were working in that area. We made a phone, phone call to every area. We called uh, Salt Lake. We called Ogden, Springville. Um, we even called Vernal and Price. Uh, and also the western region. And we asked them to give all available people that haven't headed in that direction head up to Goldville. We kind of gave them some, uh, a place to go, but we finally ended up uh, finding a place to put it. Um, so, Bob, the temperatures at that time were minus 29? Yeah, 20 some odd degrees below zero. So, and that was in the Goldville. Yeah, so that's chilly. And you still didn't know the problem Goldville, yeah. You still didn't know the problem uh, right then we did we uh, we weren't positive. But we already had a guy heading in that direction to uh, figure it out for us, and pulled the number one regulator station. <coughs> so at that point, we contacted the county to activate a reverse 911. I think you know what that's about. But we we asked uh, we were going to have them ask the residents out there to turn down the thermostats, so we could maybe preserve a few uh, customers. But uh, really, that didn't that didn't do a thing for us. Um, when we finally ended up losing it. At 5.44, I decided, uh, with the uh, permission of uh, Colleen and Craig, we uh, do a complete shutdown. Now, 
the reason we do that, there's a very good reason. Um, it's just not like the electric company or any power company across the United States when you get the problem fixed, you turn it off or turn it on. It's not how it works. Uh, we have to go to each individual home and shut their meter off, each individual house. Uh, the reason being is if there's some gas in the line um, and that gas is allowed to enter the house, there's certain safeties on home. So let's just say in this particular case, gas went off for a period of time. We didn't actually lose everybody. We lost a good portion of We don't know how many we actually lost right off the bat. But we lost it to some, so we had to treat it like we lost everybody. So if there's gas in the home and the valve is on at the meter, each, home, each appliance is fitted with a, a safety uh, item on their furnace and water heater. And uh, what that safety item does is if the gas goes out, the flame goes out, and then there's gas re reintroduced later, it won't let gas go past the, that safety. Unfortunately, we can't rely on that because every once in a while there'll be one that will fail and introduce gas into the house and it just into that appliance and it'll just go right into the house. Of course, there's vents there that'll help it go out, but we can't take that chance. So we have to shut every appliance off, or not every appliance, but every house meter off. So we have our uh, employees going door to door and shutting off uh, valves. But first, uh, let me just quickly show you what we had in the way of a problem. We had, uh, this is a this is the meter right here. So this is a uh, Questar pipeline station. So the gas that's delivered to us is metered so we can pay for it. That meter was the problem right there. And you see all this frost on here, that's normal. When we get a high, uh, high volume of gas going through that it's being regulated, dropped in pressure, we'll get that, that freezing. But that wasn't the problem. Uh, this is the valve after we tore it apart. You look down in there, well, you can't look down in there, but that's uh, you know working. So they have big fins, and they rotate, and that's how that gas is measured. So we had one of our employees up there, and he tore this part, tore into it, and that's uh, that's and we we didn't know the problem, what the result was at that point. We just knew on the outside outlet side of that meter we were not getting any gas, so it stopped right there. That meter basically froze up. Is that your meter or is that Questar Pipelines? It's Questar Pipelines meter. And your guy was able to take it apart? Or? Yeah, and we, and within a few minutes we had the thing changed out to a new meter as well. But uh, anyway, that was the problem. But that's what we discovered was the problem. Now, here's, here's the other part of this. We had two-way feed into this area here, so you're thinking, well, you know, if you got two-way feed, we wouldn't lose everybody. Well, as Coley said, it was uh, over 20 below zero. Um, the other side of that feed just was not enough to keep up with it. We just couldn't handle it. So we didn't lose everybody, but we lost enough. We didn't know who we lost. So we had to treat it as we lost everybody. Um, so again, we got uh, the shutdown order uh, for the town of Colville. And also, we uh, we sent everybody in our uh, in our company. Uh, we made a deal with Flair Construction up there in Colville and used their area. Now, in that building they've got, you can let's see. Wait a minute, we, we lost that picture somehow. It's coming next. Okay, okay. Let me go. Let me go by this thing here. I'm trying to do this by memory. It's not working. So, North Summit High School. We selected that as kind of a place for people to go to keep warm if they had to. Uh, so we uh, set up a. We we're going to set up a CNG trailer there to make sure that ran all the time. And those CNG traders are worth their weight in gold because we can do that. We can run that place uh, independently of the gas system. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, nobody even came. Uh, Red Cross was involved in it as well, but everybody kind of just dealt with it. Put on a jacket. <laughs> Hunkered down. A big jacket. <laughs> uh, and this is really neat. This is a neat picture here. This is Flair Construction's yard. Uh, they let, let us use that. They got a big auditorium in there. Uh, where we could house all of our people in that sound system to where we could uh, have a big, a big meeting. But you can see these are all our trucks parked around there. This, uh, there was quite a few trucks there. And I'll tell you what, I was really proud of our employees that day. They just came to work and, and did their job. So, at 11 a.m., uh, we got on the telephone and they put that through their sound system up there in that, uh, in that office. And I basically did a JSA. JSA is a job safety analysis. We just wanted to make sure they knew all the uh, uh, hazards that were out there. We identified those. We, we talked about dogs, 
have a good boy, don't that kind of stuff. Even though those dogs would be very cold. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter, they're out there. <laughs> we still get bit on cold days. So, uh, you know, we talked about all the hazards that we found out there that we would find and asked for questions. They participated and we sent them to work. We felt like it was important to do that job safety analysis. So, again, we started shutoffs about 11.25 in the morning. At 2.06, uh, we made a call to the religious leaders up there because we knew we weren't going to be able to find everybody home. And, again, that's a, that's a bad deal because if you've got uh, temperatures at around zero or below and uh, people are not going to be there for more than eight or seven or eight hours, you know what happens. They're going to have freeze-ups and nobody wants to have their house freeze up. So the religious leaders were key in this, where they got a hold of their uh, their congregations and found out, okay, so-and-so is not home. Has anybody got a key? Do we know who the daughter is, son is, father, or whatever? And we were able to access a lot of homes just on that. So that made it uh, uh, really good. And, you know, that took several hours to make all that happen, but we, uh, it worked out really well. Well, didn't we also contact the mayor and the community? Yeah, all the... Uh, uh, Political leaders and that knew what was going on. We, we kept in touch with them the whole time. So they knew exactly what was going on there. So there's a total of 629 customers we shut off. It's quite a few. <laughs> you have to go door to door. But, uh, and it took, so it took us a while to do that. And like I say, up to 2.30. First we had to mobilize, get everybody up there, do our JSA, and then get them to work. But uh, you can see from 11 to 2.30 to shut off that many homes, that's pretty good. Good people. And also we shut the gas off of Coville number one. Now Coville number one is our regulator station up there. That's the one where the meter is. Uh, so that's the main feed for Coville. So we shut that down at, at 245. Actually, you're back bringing on. it back on. Or, excuse me. I'm sorry. We turned it back on. Sorry. Okay, at 255, we again, we brought everybody back into that same room and did another JSA. Uh, talked to them about safety. Make sure that they were all aware of the situation up there. Uh, talked about being cold and what they needed to do, all those things. And then uh, we turned them loose at 310 and said, let's go relight. And as you do this, everybody's, uh, here's the other deal. we got to go knock on the door, find out if they're home. And we, if they're home, we go to the meter, we turn it on, and we go, no, first of all, we go in the house, we shut off all the appliances, and we go outside, we spot, turn the valve on, spot the meter, make sure there's no leaks in the fuel line. If there's any issues, then we got to fix them. Then we can go in and start relighting appliances. So it's not just, like I said, turn on a switch. It takes a lot of time. And at the very least, at the very minimum, is 20 minutes per house. So again, very proud of our employees. One, at 10 p.m., we had 95% of all of our customers back on up there. I had made a commitment at 10 o'clock to have them all done. I was wrong. <laughs> because, uh, we had a, a, quite a few that were not home that we had to get a hold of. So uh, at 2 a.m., we finally had all the gas restored in the entire Colville area. But what we had to do, we got a hold of the fire department, and we also got a hold of the locksmith. And uh, yeah, this may sound horrible to some, but I'll tell you what, if you come home and your house is frozen, it's not going to be too neat. But we hired a locksmith and got the fire department involved, so they were with us. Uh, we had the locksmith pick the lock. We went in the house, being uh, escorted by the fire fire department, went in and relit their appliances, had to walk back up and left. And we didn't have one complaint. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, it's always a little squeamish when I talk about that, but if you were in that situation, wouldn't you want to do that? Yeah. Because uh, even if even if we'll, we can repair broken water lines and that kind of thing, it'll plague you for your life. That's also the same. Knowing that that appliance was turned on properly. Yes. Not gas. Mm -hmm. you know, and also, there may be somebody in that yeah. home that was bedridden or couldn't get up or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that was also a concern of ours. So, we had to get in those homes. There's no getting around it. And that's why we tried diligently with the religious leaders and others to try and get back, you know, get them act, get us access into those homes. In fact, didn't you have a display or something on the streets, uh, signs? Yeah, uh, there were signs out there telling everybody to. You know, the gas is temporarily off, called West Arp, uh, so we can get back in here home that kind of thing is going on as well. So we had a few lessons learned. Uh, we've got five of these 
types of meters out there uh, in those areas. Now, uh, we did this, this is that particular station, and uh, this is a solar panel up here, and basically what it's doing, it's a telemeter, so it'll tell us when pressures drop. This particular one, those pressures drop so fast, even if we had had this, we probably couldn't have responded quickly enough. But for those other stations that may have some of the same issues, uh, this may keep that from happening again, so we can get to those, uh, get to that station, make a repair, or at least put it on bypass, uh, so we don't lose all those homes. So it was a great effort by our company, uh, especially our employees. They just did a great job, and they were out till, um, you know, past two in the morning. Now, I'll just tell you this little story. I was sitting in the EOC at about two, about close to three o'clock in the morning. My back was to the door, and all of a sudden I felt a cold draft in the back of my neck. I wonder what the heck. So I turned around, and one of the guys that just got back from COVID was standing there. He was omitting cold. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been driving home for an hour. So I don't know. Oh my word! I'm serious. I, yeah. so was, it, was this meter part of the project that Questar did a while ago, where they put some meters on and just to get the information? Or they weren't like yes. It, oh, okay. Those are all, yeah. We did that because we had one feed into that into that area. And again, on this one, we had two two feeds, but it just uh, in that temperature, this wasn't. Enough. This was added after the event. Oh, okay. And then that's what we're showing. So we we've done that. Your point of haven't we been concerned about just one-way feeds is correct. That's what Vaughn just responded. We went and put these meters on all of those. This had a two-way feed, and so we didn't have it on those. But given this meter, we've now want we've now gone and put, are putting this on those. Is it five meters? Yes. Yeah. In Utah. So this, uh, yeah, these are these have been installed. And this was done. This whole event happened on a Friday. This was this was up and going on Tuesday. Hey, has a question. So is it right to understand that there wasn't a real malfunction of the meter? So it wasn't a defective meter in any way. It's just an inevitable risk that you run when the temperatures are really really cold. Well, no. Well, okay. let me let me tell you what happened here. No, it's. it's Good question, and I, I failed to bring that up. So it was because of the cold, uh, cold, but it wasn't. So here's the answer: we had gas running through that uh, pipeline faster, you know, probably as fast as it's ever gone through. And as it does that, you know, that, that pipe's been in the ground for years and years and years and years. And years. Uh, there's stuff laying on the bottom of that pipe for a long, long time. Because of that high volume of gas going through that pipe, something got picked up, and, and the analysis we got from the people that uh, uh, analyzed this meter was something about an eighth inch in diameter hard steel like thing went through that, got into those fins, took it out of timing, and it locked up. So it really wasn't that due to the cold that it was. But the maintenance yeah. bearings? Yeah, we, uh, when they Tore the thing apart, they found out that the bearings were in good shape, it had been maintained properly, and so it was just a matter of a piece of uh, bad stuff. To put so was pipeline costly? We'll say that, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, yeah. But it, it's not. Send them a bill. <laughs> our, our concern is, is that we have five meters like that, and it could happen on our system for something. And it's not like it's ever that anything should be left in a pipe but it just is a human mistake i guess that when they welded it or i don't we don't know what it could have been, been well, like, could yeah be but so we have to take the same precautions on ours but yeah we'll we'll say it was somebody else <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah I, I shouldn't say that we did that they put that in would there be a way to, to build it such that the pipe would have a tall vertical section the gas had to go through the hill slow degree down? Uh, it, that's the way this is designed. You just think yeah. about <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it just probably wasn't far enough, but that's the way this is designed is to go up. Uh, the vertical meters in a vertical position. So it had to go around and up in order to hit that. So it's pretty good velocity, and uh, usually that would take that to do it. And that's why they're designed that way, so they don't pick up garbage as they, uh, they run. But it's just a lot of volume. So could this, a, could this happen in a more populated area, the same type of problem? Oh, it, it could. 
Absolutely. Could there be thousands of customers affected at once? Um, the uh, thing that saves us on that is our number of feeds. In this particular one, we only had two two way feeds and one you know, just an arm uh, Chances of that happening in another area, a big giant population, is low, but it's always a possibility. Huntsville is a good place it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to shut off thousands of years. Actually, it only has a one way feed. That's a bad deal. I'll tell you from that. Mountain. Yeah. But from Mountain. Uh, yeah. we have we have deals with the other gas companies around us if we end up in a deal like that. Uh, it's called mutual aid we use with uh, Intermountain Gas and Southwest Gas and all these others around here. Um, as soon as we can get a drink, we put them to work with us, but we certainly hope we do we, we helped with the earthquake uh, in California. Yeah, and it's important to point out that most of our district regulator stations don't have meters. It's true. Because they're on our system. Because this was going from Quest our pipeline system to Quest our gas system, you have a meter there. So all of our district regulator stations that feed you know, most of the populated areas are coming off our own feeder lines. We don't have meters on those stations. So you wouldn't have this issue. You'd go through a regulator but not a meter. There's always an opportunity somewhere out there for a failure to happen. We do our very best with uh, proper maintenance to you know, take that risk down to as small as possible. But your point actually is one of the issues we'll be speaking to as we look at what capacities we need on our distribution system, which is what our 28th of February meeting will be specifically addressing. It's on a larger scale, but on a small scale, we don't have that. And I joked a little bit about Ogden Valley, but we're anticipating there, and we've run steel all the way over to Liberty. If they ever do go over Avon Divide, then we'll be completely looped, and you won't have that. But that would mean you'd let more people in the valley, and you don't want that to happen. <laughs> okay. Well, just, uh, again, our people made this, made this thing happen. Just, uh, when the, when the call went out, people came, and even at the end of the shift, they were willing to go up there in sub zero temperatures to help us. And uh, I'm just real proud of doing a great job. I didn't pour it too much. Yeah. <laughs> we are, Pete. Yeah, going to head into the confidential before we pitch it over to you. But thank you for being here. And um, we'll have this presentation in a, in a redacted form. Of, of what, so you'll probably be able to see some of the things that we'll have on this, but most of these slides are going to be confidential, and then we'll also have a, a non-redacted one. Yeah, just before we these, you know, the um, you mentioned in, in the first slide that if there's other topics people want to talk mm -hmm. about, should they just contact you and if sure. you need another meeting? Yeah. Okay. No, I, this is probably getting worked on the commission's calendar or. Anytime somebody has an interest and they just want a one-on-one -on -one meeting, too, or something they want to go through, we're happy to meet with them there. But if it's something that's beneficial for all to be aware of or have concerns on, we'd want to do that. So I don't know if we have anybody on, but if we've shut that off, that's the only thing. I think it was Danny, wasn't it?